Let's go ahead and turn our Bibles to 1 Corinthians tonight. 1 Corinthians. And we are continuing on our way through the Bible. Again, this is Bible survey. We spend one, two, three messages normally on each book as we go through rapidly and just get the, the high grounds, what we're looking at in our Bible studies on Wednesday nights. We find ourselves in 1 Corinthians tonight, and we are looking at a book, of course, that's written by the Apostle Paul. And this is a, a church the Apostle Paul helped plant. If you read back in Acts chapter 18, you'll see the, the account there in the uh, the Acts of the Apostle, of the Apostle Paul going, preaching, teaching, and others helping him as well. I think one thing that sometimes we think about is the Apostle Paul, he went to a city all by himself. He worked all by himself. He's, everyone's converted under his ministry. He had no help at all. Well, obviously the Lord's hand was on the Apostle Paul, and yet he had people helping him. You, you read about that in the Bible, and like the end of the book of Romans, you see him in other places thanking people who have helped him reached out. So we see very much church planning, church life is never just one individual. It's always the body working together. So in Acts chapter 18, Paul's there. It's about the year 50 is when he's preaching there. This letter is probably written roughly around the year 55 A.D. or so, somewhere in that general frame at least, written from Ephesus. And a big theme of the, of the book of 1 Corinthians is unity. Um, I think sometimes, again, we think that church problems started the last century. The fact of the matter is, you see in the, in the Bible, is that this church was began by the Apostle Paul, and what happens is, just a few years after it began, it has all these problems. And yet the reality is, not only did it have these problems, though, it had many blessings as well. It just wasn't a problem-filled church. In, in some sense, you want problems like they're having because this church was on fire, very active, very gifted, but very much needing instruction and rebuke as we're going to see as we go and look at some of these teachings from this book. So, so the main theme of this book is unity or division. They're so divided, and you remember they're divided into different groups. They're bickering between each other. Uh, you've got... People say, I'm of Paul, I'm of Paulus, etc. I'm of Christ, that's the real spiritual ones. That's not the actual spiritual ones, but they're just saying that because they're very spiritual, most likely. And what you see here is a book, really, that is written to a group of people divided. And what the Apostle Paul begins to do, and we're going to see some of this tonight, the Apostle Paul begins to humble them God's way. And he brings out doctrine and teaching and reality after reality, to humble their hearts before God. Because a people who are humble in heart before the Lord will be a people who are united before the Lord as well. It's pride that causes division very often. We know that, don't we? Pride and wanting to get our own way and coming up. It's like one man said, when, you, when we think we're little gods, when, 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 when you're a god and I'm a god and we don't get our ways, what happens? Gods fight each other. But when we are just humble believers before the Lord, what happens is we come together and we seek to do the work of the Lord together. So the big theme here of 1 Corinthians is unity. And when you look at the book of 1 Corinthians, you see two big divisions. The first division is the first six chapters of the book. And then what happens after Paul begins to try to humble them, to bring out reality to them. And if you just look over in chapter 7 you'll see that it says, now concerning the things about which you wrote. And what Paul begins to do is answer a number of questions they have. Just look really quick with me. You see that in chapter 7. You see in chapter 8, now concerning things. That's kind of the key word, I think. They've, they've written, Paul has written to them before this, and they have written back with questions to him. You look in chapter 12, now concerning spiritual gifts. Most likely a question they had of the Apostle Paul, and then in chapter 16, now concerning the collection for the saints. So these people have written to him asking questions, and he has responded. This is what part of this letter is about, is responding to, his, to the questions that they have. Now what are, what's taught in this book? Let me just name a big long list. One thing about 1 Corinthians, and you've seen it before, 
is 1 Corinthians is packed with different teachings and problems and doctrines. And uh, it's very much filled with different... Uh, I mean, all, everything in the Bible is interesting, of course. But it's very much filled with very interesting things in 1 Corinthians. It's just a very quick list. Uh, first of all, you see the foolishness of the gospel, at least to those who are perishing. That's really what we're going to focus on tonight. You see the utter necessity of the Holy Spirit's work in our heart to be saved. You see that especially in chapter 2. You see the fact that we are not to follow men. You see church discipline. You see sexual sin. You see marriage and singleness in chapter 7. You see Christian liberty spoken about. You see how we should learn from warnings and the hope from the Old Testament. The Lord's Supper is spoken about. Spiritual gifts, love, and the resurrection, and a whole lot of other things as well. So it's very much filled with um, a number of different doctrines that Paul covers here. So we're going to look at mainly two things tonight. It's all we're going to look at. I want us to think about the fact that Paul is writing and has ministered in Corinth. I think that's a great key for us to think about in our day and time. And then we're going to look at God's way of humbling men. And women. So those two things we're going to look at tonight. Before, I, before we get into it, any comments or questions? Just on the introduction there. Of course, comments and questions are always welcomed at any time. Okay, well, let's look here. Let's begin looking in chapter 1, and we'll look in verse 2. <clears throat> To the church of God which is at Corinth. Let's just talk about Corinth for a minute. Uh, why is that so important to us tonight? Well, what is Corinth? Corinth is a place filled with different people. You've got poor, you've got rich, you have Jew, you have freed slaves, you have military, you have many different people, many different ethnicities are there in Corinth. It's a large population. It is crazy about sports. Tell me the tell me the famous um, the famous games of ancient times. What were they called? The Olympic Games. Well, Corinth had games too. They were the second most popular games of the ancient world, the Isthmian Games. So this is a place that sports crazy. It's also a place that's religiously crazy. Uh, one source talked about how there was at least twenty different places in Corinth where I guess you could go and offer sacrifices to the so-called gods. You had immorality in Corinth. You had a, a great temple there, a famous temple, at least in the old city. The old city was destroyed, I think it is around 144 B.C. This Corinth was rebuilt at about 44 B.C., so it's about 100 years old right now. But in the old city, what you had at this temple was reportedly about a 1,000 prostitutes working in this temple. In fact, in the old city of Corinth, which I would imagine isn't too much different than Paul's day, you had slang terms used. You had a Corinthian girl. That was one of the terms used. Uh, obviously for someone who is uh, sexually sinning. You had a term to Corinthicize, which is another slang sexual sin term that they used, and it was all named after Corinth. You begin to see the picture of what kind of place this is. And not only did we have a sexual problem at Corinth, but you had a, a place that very much exalted wisdom. And you see that in this book because the Corinthian church thinks they the Corinthian church thinks they've arrived. In fact, the Apostle Paul says at one place, you think you've arrived. Well, I wish, I wish you were reigning right now too because I'd be reigning with you. So they really had thought they had arrived. They thought they were something. And remember, Corinth was very close to Greece, which is the, the capital city of so-called wisdom of that time. So I bring all that up not to give you a history lesson. I bring all that up to tell you that Paul's day is not much different than our day. That's the reality of it. Uh, we saw that in Romans, didn't we? When we looked at Romans. Very strong city. Uh, America. America is, is a great... I'm so glad I live in America, aren't you? So glad of this nation, and I praise the Lord for it. And I hope for the future of America to be great as well. But America, in some sense, is just like all these other cities of the past. They've been great at one time, and then something happened. 
What you have here is a so-called great city. They got everything they want. And what happens is the Apostle Paul comes to this city and through the simple preaching of the gospel, he sees men and women saved and he sees a church planted. Not by the methods of men, not by trying to fit in with the culture. He comes to a city and he, he decides, as he always did, I'm going to preach the gospel. He, he begins with going to the synagogue to, to preach. You read about that in Acts 18. He's preaching to the Jews. He wants them saved. He wants them to hear the message. And people are converted. The same thing is true for our church and our area. It's not by the, the wisdom of man, and we're going to see that tonight, that men are converted, but by the power of God. Now, now you all correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think our temptation as modern men is to always think that we are smarter than the people who lived a long time ago, and it's to always think that a long time ago it could not be as bad as it is today. Now, I'm not saying you're like that, but isn't that what most people are like? Uh, I mean, that's, that's the reality. We think no one's ever had it like we have it today. It's so bad today. If only I lived two or three hundred years ago, things would be so much better, some people think. Well, let's hear just a little bit about what it was like. This is... Uh, this is from in the seven, this is speaking about the 1700s in Wells. And I want you to listen to this description that's given. It says, and again, this is, this is 300 years ago. Atheistic clubs were formed with the express purpose of making the people a pagan nation. 300 years ago, they're having atheistic clubs for the purpose, for the purpose of making their nation, which was very religious historically, a secular pagan nation. There is no price on virtue, and religion and godliness were despised. It was publicly avowed that vice was profitable to the state, and that polygamy, concubinage, and even sodomy were not sinful. The words of the prophet Isaiah could be applied to the nation. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, the whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds, bruises, and putrefying sores. Is that speaking about America or Wells? I mean, honestly... I think he was right. Yes, absolutely. This is 300 years ago. Sodomy is okay. Uh, homosexuality is a new term that's been developed relatively uh, recently. Sodomy is the word that's been around a lot longer than that. I mean, these things are okay. That's what they're saying today. In fact, they're doing a lot more in saying that they're pushing on us, aren't they? It's being, we're being pushed upon. Um. So you see this, that was from a book called The Calvinistic Methodist Fathers of Wells. So what we see here is man has not changed. Man has not changed. The good thing is God hasn't changed either, though. Amen? And for us who are Christians, we should never despair. As long as we seek to do what God's will is, there is never a reason for us who are Christians to despair. Never. Because our God's the same God He's always been. And we see the stories, we read in the Old Testament, the deliverances, and we see that God is the God of miracles. God is the God of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we have no reason to fear or to despair in life. So I hope just seeing this from, from just that word Corinth and where Paul was at, I hope that's an encouraging to us. Because we look around and we see a lot of churches declining. A lot of churches are declining. Um, we see churches, and here's the fact of the matter, after all this is done, with the coronavirus, what you're going to find out is next year there's going to be a lot of churches closed because of this. It's an unfortunate reality. What you're going to find is a lot of churches are going to close their doors. They either cannot make it financially or they cannot make it because they don't have enough people. They close their doors. And that's it. And we're going to see, I don't know if this is true, but we may see the greatest number of churches close in one year next year after all this is done because of what's been going on in the country. It's a declining time. But 
But one thing that you see in that long quote that I read is that time was terrible. And that was just before John Wesley and George Whitfield in England and Daniel Rowlands and Wells and Hal Harris and these great preachers were raised up to preach the gospel. So any comments or questions there just about Paul's setting and our day? Any, any comments or questions there, brothers or sisters? Well, let's look at now the main thing I want us to see tonight. I want us to see God's way of humbling men. Um, Paul is writing to this Christian church. There are people very much with pride in their hearts. They think they have hung the moon and they have been very blessed of God. Don't get me wrong. They're very blessed of God. They've been blessed with great spiritual blessings. Let's just look here in... Just start in verse 4 and listen to the way that Paul speaks about them. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched in Him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what you see, this is... A church very much blessed of God. This is not really, this is not a church we may say, and maybe this isn't the right comparison, but some of the churches you read about in Revelation 2 and 3, they're just, I mean, they've, they've really messed up. Well, this church is really messed up too, and yet there's so much good in this church. But one of the problems is they are filled with pride. So how does the Apostle Paul go about to humble them and bring unity? Well, let's look at some of the things here, starting in verse 18. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Have you ever thought about the message that you and I believe that it is foolishness to the world? I know we live in the Bible Belt and oftentimes even non-Christians, because they've been raised in such a Christian context, they're at least sympathetic in some degree at least outwardly to the church. The reality is this, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. To those who are lost, the preaching of the gospel is foolishness. We're going to see why in just a few minutes. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. The first thing I want us to see tonight is that God humbles men through His message. He's, God's message, when it's preached in His truth, seems as if it's foolishness to lost men and women today. And one of the reasons that God has set this up is verse 19, He wants to destroy the wisdom of haughty men and men who have a lot of pride in their heart. He wants to bring them down. Because the only way that someone can be saved is first to be humbled. Let's just go through this passage tonight. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Now this is not talking about good, wholesome wisdom like the book of Proverbs speaks about. It's not talking about that. But it's talking about this haughty, man-centered wisdom you're going to see on television or news reports today. Uh, that man is great and, and we are evolving, getting better and better. Just give us a few more years and we'll be there. No, no. God says, I'm going to bring that down. Verse 21, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. In fact, pause there and turn over to chapter 2. The reason I'm turning there, that first part says, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. But look what the rulers of this age did. Verse 8, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. What did the great thinkers and rulers of Jesus' day think? He thought he was, they thought He was somebody worthy to be crucified. So much for the wisdom of the world then. Back in verse 21, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Now, this is why it's foolishness 
to the lost world. Verse 22, For indeed Jews ask for signs, and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block. So what were the Jews looking for when the Messiah came? What impression were they under when the Jewish Messiah would come? Right. They they thought, well, when, G, when the Messiah comes, He's going to get rid of Rome for us. It's going to be like the times of David again. It's going to be like Solomon. It's going to be better than that. The Messiah is going to come. Our political oppression is going to be removed. And our great Messiah is going to come. He's going to reign. He's going to rule. He's going to cast out all the evil. That was one of the problems John the Baptist had before he had his head cut off. Yes, here was a righteous man. He knew the Messiah had come, but here he is in prison getting ready to die. He didn't understand it. I mean, the Messiah had come. Why isn't the kingdom set up? Why isn't everything right? So the Jews thought when the Messiah came, he was going to be a conquering Messiah in the physical realm. And what happens? They have a Messiah that dies on a Roman cross, the very people he was supposed to defeat. So you have a Jew listening to the Apostle Paul preach who know that Jesus Christ died under Roman rule, and they just think it's foolishness. How can a man who died under the Romans deliver us? They're thinking about it the wrong way. And then in verse 22, for indeed, verse 23, excuse me, for we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. Now why to a Gentile was this message foolishness for? Right? That's definitely one part of it. In fact, they called Christians atheists in the first century because they rejected all the gods of Rome and Greece. So they said, well, you're just an atheist. You believe in an invisible God. Another part of this was the Gentiles sought after wisdom. And again, think about this. In fact, just turn to Acts chapter 17 and you'll see what we saw a few weeks ago. The great Apostle Paul, one of the great intellects to ever live, a great mind. He's preaching the gospel to Gentiles here, to, to uh, non-Jews. And he gets down and he's talking about the resurrection. And look what verse 32 says. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer. I mean, this was the Apostle Paul preaching. And what, did, what happened to the great Apostle Paul? They mocked at him because of his message. Uh, in one place, they called him in the Greek a seed picker. What, what that meant was like a little bird that would go out and just pick a seed here, pick a seed there, pick a seed here. What they were saying is, Paul, you just pick up a little bit of intellectual knowledge here and there. You don't know anything, though. You just pick up here and there. They're mocking Paul. They're making fun of him. In fact, in John chapter 8, in John chapter 8, verse 48, what do they say of Jesus? The Jews answered and said to him, Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Why aren't we called a Samaritan, which is a... Excuse the language, this is just what it would mean today. A half-breed is what that would mean. Why are not more of us, including myself, called half-breeds and called people with demons? Probably because we're not as faithful as we ought to be. Here's Jesus Christ going. He's preaching. He's telling the truth to these religious lost people. And they say, you've got a demon. This is a message people hated. Because it humbled them. It brought them down. Look in 1 Corinthians 4 to see more of this. I think it's right to say this. Who, who were the greatest Christians ever? It's not a trick question. Very easy. They're in the Bible. <laughs> who were the greatest Christians ever? Apostles. I think it's, and I think it's right to say the Apostle Paul was the greatest Christian ever. 
Here's how they're treated in chapter 4, verse 10 following. For we, we are fools for Christ's sake, but you are prudent in Christ. That's what he's saying to the Corinthians. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are without honor. To this present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty and are poorly clothed and are roughly treated and are homeless. I think, while I was reading that, I think of a missionary somewhere in a foreign land nobody knows about who loves God more, so much more than most Christians do. And we toil working with our own hands When we are reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we try to conciliate. We have become as the scum of the world, the dregs of all things, even until now. That's what the greatest Christians ever were treated as, the apostles, as scum. We see this message is a message that if we are going to carry this message, whether we're a preacher or not, we're going to have to be ready to be thought of as fools, even around our own family sometimes. Well, you see here the message, but let's look at the people now. So first of all, Paul says, why should you be humble, Corinthian church? You should be humble because the message is considered foolishness to the world, but you have accepted it by the grace of God. But then look at the people who are called starting in verse 26. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. Now what's that mean? Just think about us here or the Christians in this area. Most of us are what? We're just normal, everyday people and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. The point Paul is making though is this. Listen. The vast majority of Christians are regular people, poor people. They're not high up there. Look what it says in James chapter 2. James chapter 2 verse 5, Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith? and heirs of the kingdom which He promised to those who love Him. He has chosen the poor to be saved. He has chosen the the people who are lower, the people who, who by the grace of God have been humbled. You see in Matthew chapter 11. Verse 25, 26, and 27, at that time Jesus said, I praise You, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that You have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent. Again, that's not talking about the wisdom of Proverbs, which all of us are supposed to have. That's speaking about the arrogant here. The wise, intelligent, arrogant, rich. Not sinful necessarily to be rich, and yet the Bible speaks a lot about that. I praise You, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that You have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in Your sight. All things have been handed over to Me by My Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. Who does the Son will to reveal His Father to? It's the humble in heart, not the wise, not the intelligent. People have been humbled by God. So back in 1 Corinthians 1, again, verse 26, For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. Hope you all don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that (laughs) we're all regular people in here as far as I know. There's nothing wrong with that. But what I'm saying is, and what the Bible's saying is, God has not chosen, God has not brought all these high-faluting people to salvation. Now, it's not God's fault, it's their fault. The fact of the matter is, God shows the wisdom of His Gospel not not only in the message, but even in the people. Um... I mean, if, 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 if all the rulers of this world were true Christians, that would be a, a gospel message really to, to show itself as very wise. Well, look, the smartest people in the world are Christians. 
The Bible says it's, it's the humble people that He has reached out His hand to. And then look in verse 30. Not only His message humbles us, not only are the people humble, people for the most part, but we see we're humbled by the fact that salvation is God's work in our heart. Verse 30, But by His doing you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Now, this is a free will Baptist church. I'm afraid a lot of people, though, that are of our persuasion think they can get saved anytime they want to. They can, uh, they can just make a choice when they want to get saved. And yet the Bible would tell us the grace of God has to come to somebody. God has to work in somebody's heart before they can be saved. It's God's work. It's God's doing. I don't know, maybe, I don't know all of your testimonies, but maybe some of you can relate to this. Um, you wanted to become a Christian, but it's almost like you just couldn't become a Christian. Not that God was hiding in one sense. But it's, you, know, you knew you should become a Christian, but you just never could. And then God just really started to deal with your heart and, and burden you and, and draw you to Himself. Any of you ever had an experience like that? I see one head shaking, two. I'm not at all saying that it's in one sense, a difficult thing to be saved. As soon as a person repents, they're a Christian. We don't want to make it more difficult than the Bible does. And yet it's God's work in our heart that has to draw us to Himself. And then look here in verse 31, you see the end of all of this, really. So that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Now here's what some people might think when they hear me going through this and read that passage, read that verse, they may say to themselves, now why is God so hard? Why does God have to be the one to humble everybody? The fact is, what this, hum this humility that God is instilling in people's hearts is just showing us the reality of who we are. Uh, humility is not making us lower than we really are. Humility is just seeing who we really are. And before God, because of our sin, we deserve hell. And here is God's Word coming to us. It's humbling us. It's trying to get us down to where we really are that we may look up to God and receive grace from Him. I've got a few other things I want us to see in regards to this. Before we go on, any comments or questions on this so far? Okay, look in chapter 2. You see the message, you see the people, you see salvation, you see the result. But here's an example of Paul. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul, the great preacher, the greatest Christian to ever live. What does he say about his own experience? Verse 1, And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ, and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness, and in fear, and in much trembling. Can you imagine the Apostle being like that? That's probably going back to Acts chapter 18. You'll see that the Lord comes to Paul and says to him, don't be fearful, Paul. I've got many people here. I believe is what it says there in Acts 18. He comes and comforts him, and he says that no harm will come to you here, Paul, when he's in Corinth. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, verse 5, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. That's what all of our faith rests upon. You know, I like arguments, um, apologetics. You all may be familiar with apologetics. That's just simply defending the Christian faith. I enjoy things like that. But if we build our faith upon an argument, when we, when we hear a more persuasive argument, whether it's true or not, our faith is going to fall down. Our faith has got to be on something more solid, right? It's got to be on the fact that the Spirit convicted us of our sins and we know there's a God and we know that God has saved us through His Word. It's based on what God has done for us. I think I'll stop there. I got maybe just a few, I got a few applications I want to say now, but any, any, any comments or questions about the verses we've looked at tonight?
Right. People are generated, not uh, yes. the, uh, I feel like the focus might be why we're you know, seeing churches decline today instead of you know, letting God grow the church. We, we try to pick that ourselves away. Yeah, I see what you're saying now. Yeah. What's your own wisdom to try to grow the church and not let God do it himself through, through his word and through, obviously, through us preaching the gospel right. through our efforts? But, right. Yes, I agree with you. A um, lot of manipulation and evangelism, which, uh, you know, it's been called the hula hoops. You get them to jump through the hula hoops, and when they're done jumping through the hula hoops, you got them, and you just tell them to repeat a prayer, and then it's over and everything. Uh, nothing wrong about praying to be saved, but you think you, I've said, I've talked enough about that in the past for you all know what I mean. Just a lot of manipulation. And, and one thing that you see is when you stop, and I'm not saying you, like in, in you, you, but just generally speaking, when people stop trying to manipulate people, and I'm not talking about emotion. We need to have emotion, amen? We need to preach and witness with emotion because there's a hell and a heaven. But we stop trying to twist people's arms and play games with their minds, we'll find out how much power we really have in the Christian life when we witness and preach. And it ought to lead us to pray more. Because we see, you know, nothing's happening. I need to rely on God much more than that. That's good, John. Anybody else tonight? Well, one thing that we see from these passages, just about our own humility and God humbling us as Christians and humbling the Corinthian church, is that really and truly, I've already said it, but we have to die to ourselves, don't we? Um... We have to be done with trying to look smart in the world's eyes. Raise your hand if you don't want to look smart. <laughs> we all want to look smart, don't we? In fact, that was one of the temptations that got Eve to sin. She saw the tree that was one to make one wise. That's what I need. And if you remember in 1 John chapter 2, it talks about the boastful pride of life. That's one of the temptations the devil really gets us. So what we have to do is daily we have to die to these things. If we are going to be faithful, we're going to lose friends. If we're going to be faithful, it doesn't mean we're trying to do that. But if we're going to be faithful, we're going to have our families mad at us sometimes. If we're going to be faithful, we may even have our closest friend turn on us or family members turn on us, church members turn on us. Why? Not because we were doing things wrong, but because we have to speak what the Word of God says. And what you find is people aren't going to like you very much. Now, I'm not trying to make it sound. How many of you have friends? Raise your hand if you've got friends. That's good. Almost all of us raise their hand. No, I'm just blind. Well, we're going to have friends. Uh, Nick, we could have some lost friends. We're going to have good Christian friends, aren't we? We're going to have people that love the Lord and they love us and they want truth. And that's really what the local church is, the body of believers coming together, loving each other under the Word of God. Well, here's another application for us tonight. This humility that comes with the message of God. Why would we try to impress the world for? The world thinks our message is silly. So why would we turn the church into some kind of um, theme park? Right? I mean, we like to have fun. We got a youth activity coming up soon. I like fun. But you know what I mean. Our services, making them a zoo, basically. Well, that's not going to do anything. That's going to build a crowd up, but the only way to keep that crowd is to keep the zoo going and make it bigger next time. Because people get tired of the zoo after so long. Really what I see, and unfortunately at times I've seen it in my own life, churches today have, like it's been said, they've lost confidence in the Word of God, in prayer, in the Holy Spirit. They've lost confidence that that's enough to get the job done. That is enough. And, and what every local church in this area needs to do is come back to the realization that if we follow what God has said and not give up after a short time, not grow weary in well-doing, but continue to do what's right, God will bless the church. It may not be like we want it. I don't know. I don't know what God has in store. But God's going to bless His church. He's going to take care of His people.